Hopefully by now you're getting the idea the power series are just another type of function we play around with. So one thing we're going to want to do is take derivatives and antiderivatives of power series. So let's take a look. So let this be our power series, a sub n, x minus c raised to the n. So we're going to be centered at c. We'll write out the first few terms. And we're going to have an interval of convergence, c minus r to c plus r. There's the picture. r could be infinite, not a problem. If r is equal to 0, then our function is only defined at a point, and then derivatives and antiderivatives don't make any sense. What's the rule going to be? The rule for doing a derivative or antiderivative is just term by term, meaning like how you would do for a polynomial. You're just going to take the term you're looking at, find its derivative or antiderivative, and then just go through the next one to the next one, add up your results. OK, so what's the rule going to be? Well, if I'm going to take the derivative of this thing, then that's just going to say do the derivative of each piece, add it all together when you're done. So a0 goes to 0. A1x minus c, well, x minus c is going to go to 1. So I'm just going to get an a1. For my a sub 2, x minus c squared, what are we going to do? We're going to bring the 2 down, subtract 1 off the exponent, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Derivative of the inside is just 1. So that's going to give me 2 a sub 2, x minus c. In general, what are we going to do? We're going to take that n up there, bring it down, subtract 1 off the exponent, and then derivative of the inside is just going to be 1. So we'll get n, a sub n, x minus c, n minus 1 power. That's my derivative. For the antiderivative, what are we going to do? Well, again, we're going to go through term by term, take all the antiderivatives of each piece, add them together. And since we're doing an antiderivative, I also throw in a constant of integration. So what's going to happen? First, we'll throw in our constant of integration. Any derivative of a0 is just going to be x. OK, you notice we want a0 x minus c. That's not a problem because we're off by a0 c. So we can fix that just by lumping it into constant of integration. So this term is going to be all right, as long as we're not fixating on a specific point yet. All right, rest is going to be smooth sailing. So any derivative of a1 x minus c, well, you can do a u substitution with u equal to x minus c, then du equals dx, and then the rules just add 1, flip it over for u. OK, so that'll go to a1 over 2, x minus c squared. And then in general, you'll note, what are we going to do here? Same idea. We'll have u to the n, so we'll add 1 and flip it over. So that's going to give me a sub n, x minus c to the n plus 1, divided by n plus 1. And then our c and our a0 x minus c have already been taken care of. So that's going to be our general formula for an antiderivative. Now, the only catch is, what about the new intervals of convergence? So these are pretty, these processes are pretty involved. Do we do real damage to that? Well, very little. The rule is going to be, your interval of convergence for these new series is going to be exactly the same as your original one, except maybe at the endpoints. So you'll need to recheck your endpoints to see whether they make it through or not. OK, let's take a look at an example. It's going to be our old friend, f of x equal to the sum n from 1 to infinity, x to the n over n squared. So I write out the first few terms so we could just see that our formula matches up with what we actually do. So I'm going to take the derivative. So all we're going to do here is bring the n down, subtract one off of it. But note, when I bring the n down, it's going to cancel with one of the n's in the bottom. So what's going to happen over here is that's going to turn to a 1, bring the 2 down, give me an x over 2, bring the 3 down, gives me x squared over 3, and so on. And these two are going to match up if you track out what's happening. OK. Interval of convergence for the original function, we've worked this through before. That's going to be from minus 1 to 1, and then we're going to include minus 1 and 1. What about for the new function? For the derivative, well, interval of convergence is going to be exactly the same. It's going to be from minus 1 to 1. But we note, if I put 1 into it, what happens? OK, well, if we put 1 into here, we have 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. That's going to be the series for 1 over n. 
we know that thing diverges. So what just happened when I took the derivative of the power series, we lose one of our endpoints. If I look at minus one, that'll be minus one to the n minus one over n, and then we'll be fine. That's going to be an alternating series. And as you go through that, we've done this example also. So we know that that thing's going to converge. So we lose one of our endpoints. How about the antiderivative? OK, well, the rule here is going to be throw in your constant of integration, and then just integrate like you normally would. So we're going to add 1, flip it over, which is going to give me x to the n plus 1. We'll have an n squared, and then we'll have n plus 1 in the bottom. So if you take a look at this thing, OK, and we can write out the first few terms here just to convince ourselves that we're doing things right. So let's take a look. Well, we're going to have interval convergence going from minus 1 to 1. We don't know if the endpoints are in yet or not. We'll have to check that. So let's take a look. If I put a 1 in here, what's going to happen? We're looking at the sum, 1 over n squared, n plus 1. OK, if you squint a little bit, that looks like 1 over n cubed. So we're going to want to use limit comparison test with our b sub n equal to 1 over n cubed. They're both going to converge because 1 over n cubed converges. That's going to be a p series with p equal to 3. p is bigger than 1 in this case, so conversion. For the other endpoint, well, you could either go with an alternating series. Eh, you got to do the work of checking the three conditions. So why don't we just use the absolute convergence test? If I get rid of the minus signs when we look at x minus 1, I'm just going to throw the minus signs away if I take absolute value. We just saw that that series with the absolute value will converge. So if I put the signs back in, that'll converge also. That's what absolute convergence test says. If you can get your series to converge with the absolute values around your terms, then the original thing converges also. So what's happening here? We're not going to lose the endpoints when I take the antiderivative.